Thank you for joining us today. I want to welcome everyone to the STS Early Career Webinar Series. Today's webinar is titled, The Business of Medicine, How to Successfully Transition from Training to Practice. Please note that this webinar is being recorded and will be available next week on the STS website and STS YouTube channel. We invite you to become a member of STS if you're not one already. You'll enjoy a variety of benefits and opportunities to help you grow professionally, plus discounts on educational offerings and resources designed specifically for early career surgeons. One of the most important things you can do is partner with an organization that will help you broaden your skills, connect with peers and mentors, and take care of your health and well-being. Learn more at sts.org slash membership or use the QR code on your screen. Early career surgeons are also encouraged to visit the Early Career Hub on sts.org for access to podcasts, blogs, videos, publications, and other resources designed specifically for surgeons in the early stages of their career. Dr. Mitzman, would you like to say a few words about STS membership? Good evening, everybody. My name is Brian Mitzman, and I'm a thoracic surgeon at the University of Utah. I lead the Early Career Task Force on Education of the STS. And with support of the STS staff, we're excited to continue these early career journey webinars. And I want to send a sincere thanks to Beth Weiner and the rest of the STS crew for helping make these happen. As an early career surgeon, membership in STS opens up numerous doors for networking and personal growth. It provides a community of surgeons to support you as your career moves forward. Importantly, your membership supports events like these early career journey webinars. If you aren't a member, please consider joining. If you're attending STS 2024 in San Antonio, make sure to check out a new edition this year, The Hub, a destination for early career surgeons and trainees to experience sessions and mentoring opportunities directed towards those just getting started. On that note, back over to Beth and let's get this fantastic webinar going. Thank you, Dr. Mitzman. At this time, I am pleased to introduce tonight's moderator, Dr. Andrew Brownlee. Welcome and let me turn it over to you, Dr. Brownlee. Big thanks to Brian Mitzman, the chair of the Task Force on Education for his uh, leadership and efforts to support this webinar. It's an honor and a pleasure to be moderating this STS webinar this evening. Uh, this lecture series are, is part of an early career journey webinar series. Throughout this webinar, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A function to submit your questions and we'll address them after the presentations during about a 20 minute Q&A session at the end. The goal of this webinar is to give residents, fellows, and early career surgeons insight into the job search, contracts, finances, and other tangible and intangible ways to be successful and more importantly, happy as an early career surgeon. Today, we have three very special speakers. We have Dr. Adil Hussain, a professor of surgery and pediatrics, chief of the section of pediatric cardiothoracic surgery at the University of Utah, co-director of the Heart Center at Primary Children's Hospital. We have Dr. Mark Block, Chief Division of Thoracic Surgery at Memorial Healthcare System in Hollywood, Florida, and Dr. Larry Kaiser, Adjunct Professor of Surgery at the University of Pennsylvania, Perlman School of Medicine, the Lewis Katz Dean Emeritus at the Lewis Katz School of Medicine at Temple University, and the Managing Director uh, at Alvarez Marshall Healthcare Industries Group healthcare, Health Systems Practice. My name is Andrew Brownlee. I am a cardiothoracic uh, surgeon at the Cedar sinai Medical Center. Without further ado, uh, Dr. Hussein from the University of Utah is going to give his insight into entering academics as an early career surgeon. Thank you so much and take it away, Dr. Hussein. Well, I wanted to thank Dr. Brownlee, Dr. Mitzman, Beth Weiner, and the entire STS staff for this opportunity. Um, I think it's a great uh, topic in terms of assisting early level surgeons in um, practice in terms of making what a transition that sometimes can be fairly daunting, uh, maybe made easier by just having some insights about the process. So I have no disclosures, but I'd start by saying, I'm not sure that I'm a true academic surgeon. Um, you know, the triple threat academic surgeon of clinician, technician, as well as a researcher and then an educator is something that's eluded me throughout my career. And I've found a lot of solace in recognizing that mentors and other partners I have have allowed us to create teams that are triple threat teams. 
So I start by that disclosure. And secondly, I think a lot of the thoughts I'm going to share are going to transcend all types of practice, whether it be academic or private practice. And I think that's valuable to, to begin with. So Isaac Asimov is a really well-known uh, science fiction writer. He actually was a biochemistry professor at Boston University. And this quote has always resonated with me. Life is pleasant, death is peaceful. It's the transition that's troublesome. And I think the transition in your early career uh, in academic medicine can for sure be daunting and somewhat uh, creating and striking some fear. Um, definition of transition, a change from one thing to the next, either an action or state of being. And oftentimes we think about this in terms of goals or actions or timeline. And I would submit it's not only important to identify what your goals are, what actions you want to take in the timeline to get those goals accomplished, but more so invest in a process that's going to allow you to best understand these concepts. Your support system and the accountability is also critical. You have to understand and respect your system. Where are you beginning your first academic position? How is the system set up there? How is leadership set up there? What is the culture of leadership there? And what are their expectations of you in terms of your accountability, but more specifically, how are you holding yourself accountable? And finally, commit to the challenge. Any transition is difficult, and I would suggest that first academic position is perhaps the most daunting challenge of your career. It's never easy, it's going to be difficult. Embrace it, stay committed, and remain confident. There's a reason you've succeeded thus far in your career, and there's a reason why those successes should invariably continue. I think pace is really important. Oftentimes, anytime we go through a transition, I think our pace is too quick. We want to accomplish things in an expeditious fashion. We want to prove ourselves, create our identity, make sure that everyone understands our degree of worth. And I think pace is really valuable. Having a degree of maturity regarding pace and understanding that the process will take time to establish yourself, create an identity for yourself, a reputation for yourself, is always something that with deliberate pace will likely be more successful. So I'll break this down into transitions regarding your clinical and surgical approach to your career, your research approach, and then finally educational uh, aspects. I think there are a lot of different variables that impact your transition to becoming a clinician or an independent quote unquote surgeon. The institutional culture is extremely valuable to identify and understand. How are you being brought into the system? What are the expectations of your surgical productivity? Is this an institution where you'll be given immediate block time or are you gonna be part of a team? How are cases gonna be divided? Having an understanding of that, not having assumptions and being very up for, upfront in terms of asking the questions so that you have a better understanding of institutional culture is very important. The team's operative system is also critical. How an operating room is set up is different from institution to institution. The relationships that you have to form with anesthesia, with your operating room team, with your senior surgeons in the arena of cardiothoracic, with your perfusionists and others is extremely important to navigate with pace, with respect, with some degree of deference, but also being bold in terms of introducing concepts or ideas you may have that are important for you within your operating room environment when you're doing a case assist and to have assistance. I think it's critically important early in your career to be an excellent surgical assistant. It's something that I wish I had spent more time becoming better at early in my career. And I think I've evolved by having great partners that I really enjoy assisting currently in my practice. And you have to be very authentic and very honest about when you need assistance. Safety and good outcomes are critically important, especially early on in your career. And for that matter, throughout your career, and I think the value of having assistance in the OR with other mentors, other senior surgeons, or even other partners is always a critical barrier to overcome, a culture to set, and something that you should feel extremely comfortable with. In the end, all of these things require you to have good relationships with your partners and your leaders. And I would really emphasize throughout this talk, creating those relationships early on within your institutional environment are important. The concept of independence is something that I sometimes chuckle at personally as well. I think being an independent surgeon will evolve and occur, but even to this day, there are some operations where I'm not an independent surgeon and I enjoy having assistance from partners and other surgical expertise in the 
operating room. And so I think independence is something you should pursue, but be thoughtful and realistic about, as well as the con concept of transitioning from competence to mastery. Pace is going to be important. Time is going to be important in evolving this in a safe and constructive fashion as you continue to enhance your relationship with your partners is critically important. And finally, I'd note it's really valuable to have a healthy approach to poor outcomes. Oftentimes, we become very isolated and really limit our abilities to seek assistance and guidance when we have a poor outcome. And having that vulnerability to reach out to partners or other institutional supportive systems is critically valuable because we all will have a poor outcome. And oftentimes, early in your career, a poor outcome can be more devastating and very detrimental to your progress. I would finally say, is your brand clinically driven? And over time, you'll have to determine how much of your brand or your identity is gonna be clinically driven versus other arenas within academics. In regards to your research, I'm sure that many of you will have prior interests prior to coming into your first academic appointment, and you should make sure that you stay true to those interests. Oftentimes, the recruitment process will be focused on those interests, and setting expectations in terms of how you want to continue to pursue those interests is valuable. The realities of protected time can be very eluding and very difficult to define, and I actually believe they're completely operator dependent. What I mean by that is that oftentimes junior level surgeons and initially in academics, we want to prove our mettle in the operating room. We don't want to lose out on cases and we want to make sure that we're continuing to progress in regards to our technical proficiency. And oftentimes our protected time isn't really protected because we lean towards clinical evolution rather than our research platform. And for those of you that really want research to be a critical component of your identity or brand, I would encourage you to be thoughtful about protected time and actually make it protected. And this conflict with clinical trajectory is something that you should really discuss with your leadership, with your mentorship, and define for yourself. The importance of this in terms of fiscal implications should be not understated. And the value in terms of learning how to write grants, to obtain external funding, and to ensure that your initial package in terms of compensation includes a research component so that your research interests can be helped moving forward. Again, these things rely significantly on relationships that you form not only during the recruitment process, but once you begin your initial academic appointment. Education. I would suggest that teaching is always constant. You can teach in any environment, whether it be on rounds, whether it be to medical students, to residents, and teaching can be something that evolves and you should create your own platform in terms of how you want to educate. If you have a keen interest in education, a strong relationship with the program director at the academic institution that you're a part of is very important. Program directors are always looking for assistance, for guidance because of the many tasks that they have to accomplish. And I think anybody interested early on in their career regarding education can clearly gain an advantage by having a good relationship with their program director. Opportunities with the affiliated medical school in terms of medical school education, whether it be in anatomy labs or in other types of didactic environments can also be very helpful. There's also pathways with industry, whether it be with wet labs, robotics, or whatever your interest may be. Don't downplay the uh, importance of a valuable relationship with industry in terms of promoting educational content within your institution. And again, I think establishing relationships is the key in regards to this pathway. Baseline ingredient, you should always have stocked in your pantry. This is a quote that I was given early on in my training in terms of always having an interest in education, especially if you're gonna permit yourself to be part of an academic practice. In the end, I think transition is always a concept of worth and worth has many different definitions. Is worth rank in terms of your academic rank and the focus upon how you're gonna per per perceive promotion and obtain promotion over time? Is it title? Is it a leadership title that you wanna obtain with some time? Oftentimes it's a difficult concept to discuss, but for many individuals, compensation is how they define their worth. And for others, it's their ability. How are they technically progressing? How is their research progressing? How is their educational interest progressing? What is really worth? And what I would suggest is that worth is your self-worth. I think it's really important to identify 
what self-worth is for you and to recognize that your professional environment isn't the only component of your self-worth and the trials, the tribulations, the challenges, the difficulty in terms of finding pace through this journey shouldn't be the only thing that you define your self-worth as. I'm a big fan of this concept of individual development plans. I think oftentimes in academics, we meet with our chiefs and overall have a yearly goal and objective plan in mind that gets documented. But I would suggest that an IDP or an individual development plan is a better, more thorough way to think about your initial career progression. And I'm happy to provide some examples for this to anyone offline if they want to reach out by email. But an individual development plan starts with personal values. And if you look at this particular website, you can come up with about 75 to 80 personal values that you can choose three or four from, and they can be your guiding principles throughout not only your professional, but your personal life. Career vision and mission statements, I think, are very important to identify, to write down, and to describe early on in your career so that as you come across different opportunities, as you have to make different decisions regarding how you're gonna spend your time, does it align with your career vision? Does it align with your career mission? Self-assessment, you know, what are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? What opportunities do you see early on at your academic practice? And what are the threats to receive and to achieve the goals that you've identified? And I would really encourage people to have short-term objectives. What are your objectives for the next year? And you can use the SMART approach. What are specific goals you want to have in the next year? How are you going to measure successes? What actions are you going to take to obtain those successes? How relevant is it to your career vision or your career mission? And how timely is it? Is it truly attainable within a year? And then career planning over a three to five year vision. Other aspects of an individual development plan actually delve into time allocation. These are four very important questions that I would suggest early career and actually at any stage of your career are valuable to ask yourself. What are you doing that you don't want to do and why are you doing that? What have you been asked to do by leadership that you don't want to do? What are you doing that you want to continue to do and how can you do more of it? And what do you want to do that you have not started? These may seem like simple questions, but if you spend some time actually analyzing your answers to those questions, it's going to very much help you identify better what you want your pathway to be and how you want to define your divide your time as an academic surgeon. And then group dynamic inquiries. And even if you're an early or a junior surgeon, you're an assistant professor, it's not too early to better understand your group dynamics. How would you like to grow within your section, division, department, or organization? Do you feel a sense of professional purpose that aligns with your group? What do you need from leadership to do your best work, to feel as if your strengths are fully employed or that your weaknesses are supported authentically? What is your group currently doing that you feel you should be doing better or what are they not doing that you feel that they should be pursuing? And do you feel like on a daily basis you have the opportunity to do what you feel you do best? I know some of these questions may seem fairly basic, but I think if you actually delve into answering them, it allows you a better understanding of yourself, more self-awareness, and a better ability to seek the appropriate mentorship and guidance through your leadership to actually obtain personal satisfaction. I wanted to spend a few slides in terms of things the STS does to help early career academic surgeons. The STS advocacy opportunities are with legislative groups. There's a key contact online form that you can approach through the STS website where you can meet your legislator in DC for a fly-in. You can have legislators locally come into your home office or the hospital in terms of a host facility opportunity. And there is an STS health policy scholarship through the executive leadership program at Brandeis University. There's the STS Leadership Institute. There is opportunities for early career surgeons. There's five overall events over an academic year, three virtual sessions, two in-person sessions in Chicago. And yearly, it's culminated with a capstone event at the annual meeting. And you can apply for this Leadership Institute at the STS Leadership uh, Institute section online. There's the STS Mentorship Program for early academic surgeons. You can obtain a relationship with a senior STS member as a mentor. There's an online introduction program and a process. I think this can be a very valuable process or program as well. There are research opportunities through the STS database. The Access and Publications Task Force allows for submissions to occur on two times yearly. It's a funded research opportunity where projects through the STS database 
can be funded for data analysis through the STS. There are externally funded research programs. Proposals can be submitted on a rolling basis for that process. There's the Puff Research Program that allows for the STS to provide you with data in a de-identified fashion so that research questions that you pose, you may have a better idea of what the STS database could do to help you answer those questions. And there can even be minor, da minor data requests if you have a specific inquiry or a hypothesis and you want to test feasibility in regards to if the STS database could help with that hypothesis. Minor data requests are also feasible and possible. And finally, there are several STS scholarships, primarily through the relationship with the Thoracic Surgery Foundation. I'd leave you with uh, a, a YouTube video that I'd encourage you to watch. Uh, for those of you that don't know, Carol Lawson is the head basketball coach for the Duke women's team. And she has a great uh, YouTube video that is actually a snippet from the end of practice where she talks about handling hard better. Every transition is difficult. Oftentimes when we finish our training and we begin our first academic job, we feel like we've quote unquote made it and things should be easier. And I would suggest to you that they only get harder. Transitioning from an academic promotion standpoint, transitioning to leadership positions, transitioning to doing harder cases, transitioning to expanding your research work will always get harder. And I think the best success is when you learn how to handle hard better. Don't get discouraged. This time will be hard of transition. It's supposed to be and you should just work on handling it better. And I encourage you to watch this and I encourage you to employ all the opportunities the STS offers to early career surgeons and academics to continue to pursue professional satisfaction. Thanks for your time. Thanks so much, Dr. Hussain, for a really fantastic talk. And personally, as an early career surgeon myself, I gotta say so much of that really rings true, particularly the questions we should be asking ourselves as we as we continue this journey through through our early career um, and looking forward to, to some of the discussion at the end regarding that. Um, thanks again. We now have uh, Dr. Mark Block, who's the Chief of Division of Surgery at Memorial Healthcare System in Hollywood, Florida, and he's going to talk a little bit about the considerations in transitioning into private practice as a thoracic surgeon. Thanks so much, Dr. Block. Thank you. Um, are you able to hear me? Just a quick check there. Yes. Excellent. Okay. Um, let me uh, share my screen here. And there we go. So hopefully you're seeing my slide. Um, thanks very much to Drs. Brownlee and Mitzman for inviting me and Beth Weiner for not only support on this, but <laughs> anyone in the STS knows that name. It's a tremendous help all the time. It's really uh, quite an honor and a privilege to be a part of this group and to talk to you all about my experiences um, in actually several different types of practice, not just private practice. And so I just put this graphic up to show you who I am and where I've been so you have a better understanding of my experiences and my perspective. Uh, I did my undergraduate in medical school at Yale, um, heavily interested in research did general surgery at the University of Chicago, and I was interested in research, so I took three years off to go to the NIH, NCI um, surgery branch, did a surgical oncology research fellowship, um, went back to UFC to finish my general surgery, and then did thoracic surgery at Washington University. And my first position was at uh, UC San Francisco and at the VA um, as an assistant professor. And while there, I got a VA Career Development Award and uh, had a mentor helping me do some tumor immunology research. I then um, moved all the way across the country to Charleston, South Carolina, to join the faculty at the Medical University of South Carolina. Uh, while there, I um, was one of the lead investigators on an NIH COBRA grant, um, a multi-million dollar, multi-specialty kind of grant that uh, leveraged some of my previous research. Uh, but for a variety of reasons, um, wound up uh, leaving there after a few years and coming down here to Florida. For the, at the Memorial Healthcare System where I am now. And I was in private practice for the first five or so years and then transitioned into what is essentially an employed practice. It's a large community hospital uh, with a large employed uh, physician group. So that's really where I am now. Um, looking back, I color coded everything based on the color of the schools, the institutions, and a lot of them were blue. So I guess blue is my favorite color, but it's really an experience where I started out in a very academic environment, very serious about research. I had a research lab, I had research funding, and I ultimately wound up transitioning into a position where there was no research at all. 
Um, and we can talk about that. I've, I've kind of moved back into getting research and translational research and developing good collaborations. So that is possible. Um, I sat down and putting together this talk to just try and brainstorm all the different areas in which private practice is different. And I think the talk is not just about how to succeed in private practice, but really what is different about it. I think we all go through training in very academic environments, and it's unusual to have the experience to understand what it's like to be in a non-academic setting, whether it's private practice or employed. And so I wanted to spend much of the time here um, discussing what makes um, private practice different. Uh, so uh, let me start with um, finance. I think that's the easiest one to understand. Being in private practice is essentially running a small business. You are the CEO of your business and you have expenses. You have a payroll, you have a nurse, you have a front desk person, you need to pay rent for your office space, you need to get your own in, uh, information technology, you need to pay somebody to keep your information technology running, you need to buy an EMR and figure out which EMR you want, you need to contract with the billing and collections company and stay on top of it and make sure that you're billing properly and that your collections are occurring when they're supposed to. You need to carry your own malpractice insurance. It is an expensive job to be running a private practice, but it is running a small business. Now, on the flip side, the revenue comes from patient care. You go see a patient and you bill for that patient, and that's where your revenue comes from. Whether it's an e &M code or a CPT code for doing your case, you figure out very quickly in private practice how to optimize your coding and billing, how to make sure you're writing your notes and documenting so that all of your charges go through properly and you're billing at the maximum allowable. Uh, that's where primarily your revenue comes from. That's very different from academic practices, although academic practices, of course, you can talk about the revenue models, but revenue is based on clinical practice, but there are many other sources of revenue that come in a hospital setting and that's one of the factors that goes into an employed practice. We can talk about that as well if you have questions. But the other thing in private practice is you can do ancillary services out of your office. Vascular surgeons, for example, do a lot of services in their office that they can bill for. Ultrasound studies, Doppler studies, even minor procedures. As a thoracic surgeon, I could conceivably do pulmonary function tests in my office and bill for those. I could do a thoracentesis in my office and bill and collect for that. So you can do whatever ancillary service you want and bill and collect for that, but of course you have to have the resources to support it. And then another interesting aspect of the financial part of, run, of a, a private practice that most people don't really appreciate is that you don't necessarily have to rent your office space. You can actually buy your office space. You can buy your office building. And a lot of people in private practice go that route. They own the real estate and as a result, develop income from renting out real estate to other physicians' practices, owning the building and having it appreciate. So there are a number of revenue models in private practice that you don't think about when you're in an academic practice. And it's because you really are running a small business. Now, the size of your practice makes a big difference. Solo practice, one person generating revenue, generating revenue but there's a lot of expenses. A large group practice, a lot of people generating revenue, and you're sharing a lot of the expenses. So that affects the financial balance. The other big difference in private practice is autonomy. And I think autonomy is really the definition of private practice. You are in business for yourself. You decide what you want to do, where you want to do it, how you want to do it, and when you want to do it. You're either in a solo group practice where you're completely in control, you're in a small group practice where you have a couple of partners you share decisions with, or you're in a large group practice, which may be a very different form of autonomy. You decide which hospitals you want to operate at, where you want to get privileges. You're not limited to one hospital. You can operate at three or four or five different hospitals. The type of clinical activity you do is also entirely up to you. Do you want to do small procedures, big procedures? Do you want to do interventional pulmonary work? Do you want to get into endovascular work? Those are all decisions that you can make in private practice. There's no one to tell you can or cannot do them. Um, as I mentioned, you can do your own ancillary services. And then the other big thing is geography. I came into a private practice setting really in a very different mode than I think a lot of people. I had been in academics for a while, but a lot of people wind up deciding they want to live in a certain part of the country 
there's limited academic opportunities, and that's why they wind up going into private practice, because in private practice, you choose the geography of where you want to be, and generally, you wind up staying there. But success in private practice depends on relationships. All of this aside, yes, you are autonomous and you're making your own decisions, but those decisions have to make your practice successful. That means you have to develop good productive relationships with referrings and colleagues. So to some degree, you really aren't in charge of what you do. Your relationships determine what you do. And that leads me to the work-life balance. Autonomy gives you control over your schedule, but that depends. If you're in solo practice, that means you're on call every day every weekend, every holiday. And if you wanna take vacation, you have to find somebody to cover for you. And often that is not necessarily a colleague, maybe even a competitor. If you're in solo practice, you have to find somebody else to cover for you running out of town. And that's probably a competitor. If you're in a small group practice, you can share that. But what if let's say I'm a general thoracic surgeon, I join a group practice with one other general thoracic surgeon and three cardiac surgeons. Well, that means when I'm on call, I'm going to have to cover the cardiac surgeons as well. And the cardiac surgeons, when they're on call, they're going to have to be prepared to cover an esophageal perforation that comes in. So that can generate some difficulties in terms of call coverage. You have to be available to your colleagues and referrings. When I was in general surgery, one of my attendings said that the key to success is affability, availability, and ability in that order. And that's very true. If you want to be successful in private practice, you have to be available when somebody calls and you have to be nice. You can't make them feel like they're an idiot. You can't be a jerk about it. You have to be nice, you have to be available and you have to make everybody feel valued. Politics are everywhere and there are certainly politics in private practice but they're very different than they are in academics. They're primarily based on your partners, getting along with your partners, some of whom you may not like and you may have to figure out ways to get along with them and work with them. You need to figure out the politics at the hospital where you work, your colleagues, your competitors, your referrings in the community, how to get along with them, always be supportive and never be critical of people. It's very easy, especially when you come from an academic environment where being critical of each other is part of the fiber of that. We go to m and and we are critical of the way other people practice, but everybody understands it's all to make ourselves better. Private practice that is very different. If you come off as being critical, you will rapidly be ostracized. Your uh, competitors will uh, pounce on that as somebody who's just trying to steal their practice. So you have to be extremely careful about how you interact and relate with your colleagues and competitors. You have to develop political relationships with hospital administrators, especially if you are interested in that. Many people in private practice wind up going into hospital administration, become chief medical officers, even CEOs of hospitals. So you have to understand the politics of that. And then I think in private practice, you wind up getting more involved in local medical societies as well. Another, another big difference is peer review and QI. In an academic environment, it's very clear there's a hierarchy. You're an attending, there are associate professors, full professors, there's a department chairman, and there's a dean. There's a very clear authority. In private practice, there is no undisputed authority. If uh, you go to a conference and a patient is presented at tumor board and one of your competitors would like to do an operation you think is not indicated and you say so, well, the answer is, well, who are you to tell me how to practice medicine? You are not my senior. You are not God's gift to surgery. And so the issue of who is in charge and who makes the final decisions can be very murky in private practice. And often different opinions can have equal validity. And it's very difficult to say this is the authority because there really is no one authority. So when you're in private practice, you have to be prepared to work with physicians who may not see things the way you do and may want to do things differently, which you think is wrong. And it becomes very difficult to manage that. One of the things I noted when I first came into private practice, when you come from an academic institution where people tend to be fairly accomplished and fairly uh, skilled and, and uh, within, their, within their specialty, you're dealing with people in like the top 10 or 20th percentile. When you're in a community hospital, by definition, you are at the 50th percentile. Not you personally, but the range of physicians you work with are at the 50th percentile. Some of them are very good, 
And some of them, you really question their clinical judgment. And you have to be very careful when you're working with them to make sure that everyone feels valued if you want to maintain a successful practice. Anytime a hospital tries to discipline a physician, it's fraught with all kinds of legal considerations and becomes very difficult to do. Completely different in an academic environment where a chairman and a dean can decide that a physician is not doing the right thing and they're gone the next day. Teaching and academics. Well, academics, I consider research, is very different from teaching. In private practice, there are lots of opportunities to teach. You teach allied health uh, personnel, uh, medical students who come and rotate, even residents. My hospital has a residency program. We have residents. Research is very different. And research, I think, is one of the key differences between private practice uh, and an academic practice. You are expected to produce, write, publish. In private practice, you are not expected to do those things. Those are not required for promotions because you don't get a promotion. You are on staff and you run a private practice. You run a business. You can do research if you want, but it's purely because you want to and because you enjoy doing it, not because you get paid to do it. That being said, there are many opportunities to do that if you want, uh, and it's really beyond the scope of this talk to go into that. So uh, I'd like to conclude just by showing this picture again. I think there are multiple different domains of the practice environment, all of which are somewhat different in private practice. And in an employed practice, there's some overlap, but for the most part, I think uh, my summary kind of describes the major differences that I see. The key is that it is running a small business and the key to success is being able to get along, to be available uh, and, and to work well with individuals. Obviously, being a good surgeon is important and helps to develop your reputation. But as my mentor in general surgery told me, that's actually third on the list. Availability, affability, and ability. So with that, I'll conclude, and I look forward to the conversation uh, and discussion. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Dr. Rourke, uh, for that really important insight. Uh, next, we have Dr. Larry Kaiser, uh, who's going to talk to us a little bit from the leadership perspective on transitioning into practice. Dr. Kaiser? Just unmute here. First of all, I want to thank the SDS. Um, for the invitation to uh, to speak to you all tonight. So my perspective is a little bit different than um, than Mark and uh, Adels. Um, I was the chairman of the Department of Surgery and then the president of a university and subsequently um, a dean of a medical school and, and ran a large uh, health system. And so I want to talk really from the standpoint of transition to practice from the hospital health system uh, perspective. Next slide, please. So just a little bit about knowing your value and knowing your value as a cardiothoracic surgeon, I think is particularly important because as a cardiothoracic surgeon, you are the major contributor to the contribution margin for any hospital. Many of you may not be familiar with the term contribution margin, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, it turns out thoracic surgery um, is a little bit better than cardiac surgery, primarily because of the fact that cardiac surgery has to maintain a bunch of things on the shelf, valves, stents, whatever. The net margin is determined by the allocation of some central overhead. So despite the fact that you may be generating a margin on your cases, there is an allocation of central overhead that pays for things like the administration, all of the other things that are involved in the hospital that don't necessarily generate clinical revenue. It requires a funds flow model back to the physician practice as professional fees alone cannot support salary. You heard Mark Block talk about the fact that he was in private practice, now he's employed. It is almost impossible for cardiac surgeons to be employed these days because the cost of a case, your, your cost of doing a case when you go into all those things that Mark mentioned actually exceeds that that you get reimbursed for many of the cases that you do. So you need to be employed. There needs to be a fund flow model back to the physician um, as professional fees don't support your salary necessarily. And a lot of that comes from that margin that you generate uh, at the hospital level. Now, as we see more movement in many specialties from the inpatient side to the outpatient side, that funds flow is going to become all that much more difficult. And care has to be taken as to how funds are transferred depending upon an employed or an independent relationship. So distinct entities cannot just transfer funds, but there are ways around that. Next slide, please.
Next slide. <laughs> Nothing's changing. Beth's screen froze. My apologies. I'll get to that in just a moment. Okay. Because I might be able to try to share if you can. Sorry. There we go. And if you can just enlarge that a little bit. So when I was talking about knowing your value, um, a paper that I presented at the American Surgical a number of years ago, when we looked at a hospital margin per RVU by clinical service, um, unbeknownst to me and not because I did it this way, but it turns out thoracic surgery is the biggest contributor in terms of relative, relative hospital margin per uh, work RVU. Cardiac surgeon is up there as well, but again, because of the uh, the fixed cost that cardiac surgery has, they don't quite generate the same contribution margin, but they are clearly generators, significant generators uh, to the contribution margin. Next slide, please. And just to show you, so it's very easy. To, I, I used to have a lot of people come to me and say, hey, look, I'm generating all this money for you. You got to pay me more. Well, let's just look at one practice and you look at one FTE. Now, this is not a surgical practice. But so let's look at the fact that this is a person that's generating 4,300, 4,300, uh, almost 4,400 work RVUs. They're generating a total revenue of about $200,000, and that comes down to about $45.6 per work RVU. Hopefully, many of you are familiar with work RVU at this point. So, and as Mark said, there are expenses that are generated in a practice and certainly in an academic practice as well. So you've got the provider compensation here at 132,000, benefits another 25,000. So, so the employee with benefits, salary with benefits comes out to 165,000. Then in any practice, you've got some supplies, you've got some purchase services, uh, you've got some rent to pay. So the total expenses are 401,141. And then there's an allocation of that central overhead. You've got to pick up other costs, billing, collecting, uh, contracting, IT, all of those other things. And so with that allocation now, which was 47,000, here's a practice that's losing $248,000. So despite the fact that you may be generating a lot of margin, you have significant expenses um, as well, and you need to keep that in mind. Go to the next one. So let me talk a little bit about um, some of the expectations in transitioning to practice. If you are in an employed model, there will be productivity targets commonly based on work RVUs. As we transition more to a value-based uh, type of contracting, we start looking more at quality than we look at work RVUs, but there will be some sort of target that you will be held to. Usually it's benchmarked to some agreed upon percentile and the most commonly it's about the 60th percentile benchmark to your specialty and congenital is different than cardiac is different than uh, thoracic surgery, but it's benchmarked to an agreed upon percentile. And whether you look at MGMA in an academic environment or private environment, whether you look at AAMC, whether you look at Gallagher, whether you look at Sullivan Cotter, there are benchmarks that target your productivity. For that matter, there are benchmarks about compensation as well. And ideally the compensation benchmark and what you are earning is pretty close to what the expectation is for your productivity. Each provider should be provided with timely data regarding productivity. You should be able to see, certainly in an employed academic, in an employed model, you should be able to see what your productivity is. You should be able to see it in relation to what you did last year. You should see it in relation to what your current target is. You should be able to have that visibility into your productivity. And that kind of transparency is critical in any sort of employed model and in any sort of academic model. Um, again, in anywhere, whether you're in private practice or in academic, the utilization of block time should be at about 80% or so. And if you're not using your block time, you should be giving it up in advance so somebody else can use it so it doesn't count against you. Because if you're not utilizing your block time, it can be reallocated. And for that matter, should be reallocated by an OR committee or block time committee. The reallocation of block time is critically important. If you're using more than your block time, you should be able to get additional block time. And it should be reallocated on some sort of ongoing basis, whether it's every six months or yearly. The other thing is the use of physician extenders gets into your productivity. If you're using an extender, how are you using ex an extender? And that gets into your productivity as well. Next slide, please, Beth. And again, there are lots of different financial models. Nobody really talked about that. But, but here's one model, in fact, um, that 
uh, a group was given some option here. So they were an op had an option of being able to be paid $45 per work RVU up to 5,300 work RVUs. And then beyond that, $61 per work RVU if they're greater than 5,300, or they could be paid more per work RVU up to 9,000 work RVUs and then get $61 per work RVU above 9,000. So it really depends on the activity. Very few academic practices work on this basis. Most work on a base salary plus an incentive, but there are lots of different ways to do this based on uh, productivity. In the terms of a clinical schedule, we define a clinical FTE, which is particularly important. Most academic institutions, the clinical FTE is defined as a 0 0.8, not a 1.0. 0 0.8 in an academic environment basically attributes a portion of your time to supervising residents or students, doing some sort of scholarly work, which is usually an expectation. So we start with a, with a 0.8. So again, when you look at, and surgeons are different, for instance, than we look at medicine people. If you look at a medicine person, 0.8 means eight half days per week, they should be in the office or they should be seeing patients. Eight to noon, if you're in the office, one to five, four days a week, that's 0.8. Next one, please. So I think there are a number of things, and, and, and some of my colleagues have already touched on these, but I think in any practice situation, you should always seek opportunities for leadership roles, even when they when you're still relatively junior. What about committee work? Do you want to be part of any work groups, medical directorships? Seek opportunities if you really want to advance in your practice. As Mark Block just said, you got to be available. Avail you got to show up, you got to be available. It is, and again, Mark mentioned this as well, it is critically important to recognize everyone's contribution. Nurses, techs, I put anesthesia in quotes because they're difficult to recognize sometimes. Uh, environmental service, everybody should be recognized and be part of the team. You want people to know they are part of the team so that they're not afraid to speak up because that's critical from the standpoint of patient safety. No matter what institution you go to, you need to learn the culture. Mark Block's been in a bunch of different institutions. Every one of them had a different culture. It is unique to every institution. You need to be incredibly careful about trying to make changes when you are just starting out. Don't come into an institution and think you're going to right away change the culture of that institution. Next slide, please. It is important to establish relationships with other surgical specialties. If you're a thoracic surgeon, Get to know the orthopedic and neurosurgery spine people because you can aid them in exposure. Urology, if they've got renal tumors that involve the cava, you want to be able to be involved in those. And again, the trauma surgeons, despite the fact they think they can do everything, they're not chest surgeons. And you can up their game in terms of chest trauma. Uh, when I was at Penn, I insisted that our people be involved in any chest trauma. That's a whole nother argument with those people, though, because they do think they can do everything. My point has always been, you want to be a chest surgeon? Go do the residency like the rest of us did. Don't hesitate to ask for help. If there's a senior partner who can help you think through a case, don't be afraid to ask for help, especially when you're just starting out. Dr. Cooper always made the point, don't be someplace where you're by yourself, You, especially when you're starting out. If you get into trouble, know who to call. And don't be afraid to discuss cases at a multidisciplinary conference, especially if there's some um, difficulty or, or some um, variability in how these patients can be treated. And you want to seek out referral sources both within and outside of your institution if you truly want to build your practice. Next slide, please. I think one of the things that's very important when you start off in a practice or you've moved to a different institution, start off with some straightforward cases. Don't start with the most difficult case. First impressions and reputation are key, and the OR nurses can make or break you. You have trouble right out of the gate, it will haunt you. So start off with some straightforward stuff. Best not to start with a disaster. Be accountable. Surgeons are accountable. We don't point fingers. It's never beneficial. When you have a complication, take responsibility. And I say when you have a complication, because we all have them. You want to work with the chief medical officer to practice cost effectively. You want to look at your length of stay, utilization of resources, clinical documentation, care variation, coding, all particularly effective, whether it's a, a, a all particularly important, whether you're in an academic environment or a private practice environment. You want to re keep your costs minimal and you want to maximize um, revenue. Be available for queries regarding denials. Some cases, 
may be denied. Be available when the utilization office calls you and asks about the denial so that you can get the money or the hospital can get the money. And expect frustration. Deal with it. It's no matter where you are, there will be some frustrations. Those who can deal with it effectively do well. Next one, please. Be aware of the imposter syndrome when you're first starting out. It's not uncommon. Uh, one of my colleagues, when he started off, came to me after about a week and said, I can't do this. I can't do this. He had this whole lack of uh, confidence in his own ability. He was a superb surgeon. We had him see somebody, straightened it out, be aware of the imposter syndrome. In an academic environment, you need to know the criteria for promotion. And these differ based on the faculty track. There's usually a scholarship requirement, but there doesn't have to be. You can be promoted on the basis of clinical excellence if you work in an institution where there is a clinical track, where that is the basis upon which you are judged. But in a non, and by the way, most places now we're not tenuring, we're not giving tenure to clinical um, faculty members or clinical department faculty members, but there usually is a scholarship requirement. And so even for volunteer faculty, there are some expectations. And again, I'll end by saying, resist the urge to badmouth other physicians and colleagues. It oftentimes is quite tempting. So Beth, I'll stop there. I think we've got some time left uh, for discussion. Hopefully um, with these three presentations, uh, a little different in each one, people have learned something. So thank you all. That was fantastic, Dr. Kaiser. Thank you so much. Uh, I just have actually one question for you to start off. Um, as you all know, you know, negotiating, uh, coming out of training, negotiating your contract can be pretty difficult. Um, most of the contracts that I encountered were fairly boilerplate, uh, especially in academics. Uh, and, and when, you know, a potential hire has very little room for negotiation, what parts of the contract do you think are most important for grads to look at? Should we have a lawyer involved? Does it depend on its academic or private? Um, what type of leverage do we really have? Um, and, and how much is too much to ask for? Yeah, well, there's no answer to how much is too much to ask for, but non-competes are something you really need to look closely at. Uh, you know, there's a movement in some states now to get rid of non-competes. You really need to look at the non-compete part of the contract. That is critically important. It's something that often people uh, miss. In terms of negotiating a contract, you really need to look at what your leverage is. If you are a congenital heart surgeon like Dr. Hussein and you're it, and there may be one other one, you've got a fair bit of leverage. But if you're just joining and there are other thoracic surgeons or cardiac surgeons, you need to look at the leverage you have in terms of negotiating a contract. And sometimes that first contract, it's best to accept what it is that they're offering. Sometimes we do signing bonuses. You can get a signing bonus. Um, you want to look at the benefits that come with it. In an academic environment, is there a tuition benefit? If you've got kids, that tuition benefit is critically important. At Penn, I had a tremendous tuition benefit. They paid for a, the, the equivalent of Penn tuition no matter where my kids went to school. So I had one at Yale, one at Columbia. Unfortunately, neither one went to Penn, which would have paid almost their entire tuition. But you want to look at the benefits that come with it as well. So often, those benefits can basically get you beyond some of the initial uh, compensation. You also want to look at the incentive uh, piece of the contract as well. Is there an incentive? What does it take to make the incentive? So those kinds of things are what you want to look at. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, Dr. Hussein, you were talking a little bit about time allocation. And, and one of the questions that you posed was, uh, you know, how much time are you spending doing things that you don't want to do? I, I'm wondering, for say, for example, in your six month or your one year, uh, one year eval, if if you have an idea of the things that you don't want to do, how do you how do you address that with your leadership um, in a way that's constructive? Well, I think oftentimes leadership in academia and in anywhere they sense that they're promoting your trajectory or helping your growth by giving you tasks. And I think that can be a challenging intersection, especially if those tasks are things you're not that excited about, or they don't really align with what drives you professionally. In some ways, I think it's important to have honest discussions. Uh, oftentimes, just because of human nature, you're not going to excel at taking on a task that you're not interested in. And so being very forthright early on in terms of the things that really excite you, 
inquiring about areas that the division, the department, the section needs help in that may align with things you're interested in. I think you should be more proactive in allowing leadership to understand that you're willing to take on tasks, but do it in a way that defines and allows them to understand what you're interested in rather than just saying yes to tasks that are given to you because you want to act like a good citizen. So I think you can start those discussions early on. And I would submit most leaders would actually embrace the fact that you're very self-aware and you've critically analyzed the things you want to pursue and the things that you think you could do that align with your interest to help the division, the section or the department. That's great. And I think if there's anything I've learned as well is that just to highlight that point that honesty um, with your leadership is, is the best policy um, and being true to yourself and your personal goals. Um, Dr. Work, just we have about one or two minutes left, but I just wanted to ask you very briefly in a, in a private practice model, when you have a, when you're employed as a surgeon and you're using an RVU model or some sort of other value-based model, how do you find that balance with working with partners where you're trying to you know, elevate the, the group without competing? Um, is that a challenge and, and, and how have you addressed that in your practice? Yeah, that's, uh, that is entirely environment dependent. I, I'm fortunate to be in an environment where we are not competing with each other, that our productivity is judged based on our group as a whole. And so it makes it very easy to share cases and cover for each other. Uh, you know, the downside is that uh, I know there are some other physicians and other specialties in our system uh, where, you know, one of them takes off and goes home every day at four o'clock while the other one is staying till seven or eight o'clock at night. And so in, in that kind of an environment, uh, you can become very resentful of partners. So uh, there are pluses and minuses. If you are really solely kind of dependent on your own productivity, that opens the door for uh, strained relationships with your partners. And so I would encourage people to think very carefully before getting into an employment situation where you are competing with your partners for RVUs and that determines your compensation because that's just asking for conflict within a group. And these are partners you need to depend on. If you have a family emergency, you want them to cover for you. If you wanna go on a vacation one weekend that was not planned, you wanna be able to ask your partners to step up and do things for you. And you wanna be able to do things for them. So you really wanna avoid an environment in which it is competitive. Now, um, that's not always possible, but I think there are ways to structure the uh, productivity so that there is a general recognition of group productivity, perhaps with some individual incentives. And I think um, something like that is, is functional, but I, I prefer the model where your productivity is judged as a group as a whole and not as individuals. Fantastic, thank you so much. I think we're running out of time. Um, I think that was an exceptionally productive one hour and I just wanna thank uh, all of the discussants, Dr. Kaiser, Dr. Block, Dr. Hussein, for some very unique insights. And I, I hope this was helpful for, for the, the viewers. Uh, I just wanted to thank everyone for attending. Thanks to Beth and Brian Mitzman for, for the support to, to make this possible. And um, I'll put it over to you, Beth. Thanks again. Thank you to our moderator, Dr. Andrew Brownlee, and our speakers, Dr. Adil Hussein, Dr. Mark Block, and Dr. Larry Kaiser for your participation and insight. Thank you also to Dr. Brian Mitzman, Chair of the STS Task Force on Education for his leadership in planning tonight's event. Registration for the 2024 STS Annual Meeting is open and we invite you all to attend. STS Surgeon members receive a discount while STS Resident Fellow members can register for free. This year's meeting will feature the Hub, a dedicated space for early careerists to network attend customized education, meet with mentors and colleagues, and more. Learn more at sts.org slash annual meeting. Thank you for participating this evening. Have a wonderful night.